Welcome to this special episode of the History of European Theatre podcast. This is the last in a series of three episodes where I'm in conversation with theatre practitioners talking mostly about Greek and very early theatre and how the earliest plays still work for us today. All these conversations were recorded over Zoom as at the time of recording we're still only slowly coming out of the pandemic lockdown in the UK. This episode is with Ricky Dukes, Artistic Director of Lazarus Theatre, which, as you will hear, is a company with a mission to keep works from the classical repertoire alive and in performance. Our conversation went from the Greeks to the challenges of reopening a theatre company after an enforced extended year away from performance. I started by asking Ricky for an introduction to Lazarus Theatre. Yep, so Lazarus Theatre Company was... uh kicked off and ignited in 2007 um and uh, so we've been going for some time now i think this must be what i sort of 14th 15th year um depending on if you're counting the covid year um and we actually started with a, a greek drama we started with medea and uh, we thought something you know light frothy uh accessible and fun for everybody and um yeah, we went with Medea and it came really off the back of um, as an actor being I was quite dissatisfied with the sorts of work I was doing or being offered. And someone just said, well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and and put on a show, direct something that you do think is the type of work that you want to be doing. And and I, at the time, I thought, no, you don't want to start your own theatre company because that's what people do when they can't get work, <laughs> um, which was a, a, a terrible thing to think. But at the time, it was fairly true. That's what we thought. That's what we saw actors who couldn't get any work do. So I thought, well, should we? And, and in the end, we we went for it. And and it was a bit of a baptism of fire, really. On I, I would say more on the producing side of how to do a fringe production. Um, it went well in some respects and others it was a as i say a baptism of fire so we kind of the following year rolled back a bit um and so we went to start doing a little bit more sort of scene pooly type stuff like scratch mm-hmm. nights and we did electra so our second one was um uh, another greek uh, and because there's something wonderful i think about the simplicity in in many respects of greek drama but the choral and the ensemble nature of it so although they might have a, a domesticity or an immediacy to to the audience, it might be a family drama or, you know, they're, they're dealing on a domestic uh, level to a certain extent. There's also this incredible, huge theatrical um, level. You can be a little bit more arty as well, using big companies of actors to kind of create the scene, which is something I was really interested in, that kind of arch- architectural landscape. So rather than filling the room with scenery, actually it's the bodies of the people. Mm. So the Greek, Greek drama has been quite formative for us as a company. And we work in a very ensemble way, uh, very collaboratively, normally with large casts, really, re- roughly around 10 to 15 actors, which for off West End Fringe is fairly big. Um, and our work really, I suppose, is on one level, of course, you want it to be entertaining, but I'd like to think that our work kind of starts to examine and explore some of our societal issues, some of our, now that always sounds boring and you never put that in a, you know, a, a marketing pack, <laughs> you know, <laughs> No, not that's not particularly very sexy or exciting but i think that's what the great plays do they are entertaining you know a perfect example macbeth it's incredibly entertaining incredibly theatrical but it puts the audience in some very t- tricky difficult uh dilemmas um i use the word predicament quite a lot and it's about thinking what's the predicament in the play or what's the predicament the actor has to play so the perfect predicament i suppose or one of the perfect predicaments is medea you know should why does she kill the kids should she kill the kids should she not kill the kids um that's a Mm. massive predicament and i think it's it's something that could be incredibly um fruitful and empowering for an actor to play that predicament um so, yeah, we've grown over the years. We became a resident theatre company at Greenwich Theatre in 2018, which just gave us a home, which meant uh, we could finally f- properly engage with an audience because they knew where you're going to be all the time. Because up until that point, we'd be doing one show in one venue, then moving to another. And at one point, we we're doing six shows a year in three or four different venues. So it felt like you had to kind of reinvent the wheel every production um, because you were, you were losing some audience members on the way. 
uh, from theatre to theatre. But being in Greenwich has just felt that we could put our feet in the ground a bit, have a bit of, you know, roots, to put roots down and say to an audience, this is where we are, come and experience this work. It means we can be bolder as well. We can be a little bit bolder with the, the performance style, using the auditorium. How do we use the theatre? So there's been loads of brilliant positives. Uh, and that's where that's led us up to is, is going, how do you create large scale ensemble work um, that's sustainable? And that's the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> How can you create these big productions that can pay? So uh, obviously Greenwich is just south of central London. Um, mm -hmm. do you, are you pulling in an audience from uh, a wide area? For, for, I mean, is there an audience for classics? Uh, I, we've talked about the Greeks. You've talked about the Greeks, but you'd obviously do other classic plays as well uh, in a season. So do you find there is um, an audience waiting to see these plays performed? I think we're still quite early days, you know, we're, we're, we're in the third year, technically the fourth year of the residency and without counting last year. Yeah. Without taking. Yeah. Well, that's it. You see the COVID year, do you count it or do you not? <laughs> um, um, so I suppose it's a tricky one because the theater has quite an eclectic program. So it attracts all sorts of different types of theatre goers and some non-theatre goers. And so when we started, we wanted to try and find out who the core audience of that theatre was. And we quite quickly found that there wasn't a core audience as such. Uh, there wasn't people who saw everything, but quite a lot of different types of work that would command their own audience. And the, the marketing officer at the time uh, said to me, what you probably should do is develop your own audience within this audience. So we thought, right, OK, we thought we we're going to be tapping into a 30 percent of your capacity sold straight away before the members. Mm. And, the, and that's not you're telling me that's not going to happen. So so in a way that was best, though, because we've then gone out, said to our audiences, come, this is where we are now. Come and experience this. Uh, it's a far bigger auditorium than we used to playing. It's got 400 seats, a massive stage, about 15, 16 meters wide. So it's hugely epic in its in its um, proportions, particularly compared to where we've been in studio, studio theatres. So we've had to tap into audiences of the past and bring them along with us. But it's been a huge um, opportunity to certainly get people in the local area, because ultimately, I think that's what theatres need to do. They need to serve their local community. Uh, probably first and foremost, way before you start getting people from elsewhere coming. Um, but I suppose it would depend on the show. So we've had some shows where it has been a very local audience. We've had some where that's been less so, but it's people have travelled for the work. And I guess at the moment, it's a bit too early to say what the patterns of that are. But the one, the one thing I think the pattern is, is big work. So when the, when the play is big and it has a sense of epic uh, proportions, that's the thing that's exciting and why you get on a train to go to Greenwich. We haven't done a Greek yet in the Greenwich. So that's wow. going to be fascinating to see where, whether the Greek drama audiences are going to come and travel or indeed, do we have any Greek drama fans in Greenwich? Well, we must do. We must do. That's part yes. of the next challenge. I, I, I'm sure I, I can't believe you haven't. Mm. Um, and, and maybe through this, someone will contact you because they might be listening to us now and encourage you to uh, present, I don't know, what would be your choice for uh, the first Greek play for well, the we, theatre in Greenwich? We're working on a version of Medea at the moment. Um, and I don't quite know why Medea is in the zeitgeist at the moment, but but she is again. She's, she sort of seems to be back. You know, we go through cycles, it feels to me, that we, mm -hmm. you know, certainly of Greek drama, but also of the plays within Greek drama. So Medea is the one that I, I'm completely uh, intrigued by. And a great, a great accessible one is Antigone and, and actually feels like it could be a very good first um, democratic, open, accessible uh, Greek drama before we get into sort of Cyclops and stuff. Um, <laughs> so it could be a very first, it could be a great introduction. And that's, that's something I think with an auditorium of the size that we have at Greenwich, it feels it does need to be quite broad to start with. It shouldn't be niche or boutique. It should be very accessible and very democratic. Democratic. The great thing about the Greenwich Theatre Auditorium is it's very steep and it's Greek amphitheatre-like. It's slightly wrapped around the stage. So it's it's kind of perfect for it. And we, we have mm. talked about Antigone a couple of times um, and she's always been sort of left for the side. There's a, there's a reluctance with Greek drama to program it and, and certainly every theatre we've gone to, there's always a, oh, I'm not sure there's an audience for this. Oh, I'm not sure. People are very frightened of Greek mm. drama and programming it. But actually, we found when we've done it, it's done very well. 
Right. Well, that's great to hear. Um, uh, so, yes, the big, your big stage, this must give you some thoughts about how to stage the, the chorus and, and go back to that being a big Greek chorus, because we know that originally there would have been 30 or more in the chorus. Well, that's where we get into the sort of less artistic and the more management financial side of it, because there's just no way you'll be able to afford uh, a company that big. Um well, mm. we've been talk we've been thinking a lot about this because when we were working on the fringe, we were working on a far more flexible um sort of profit sharey model where effectively if the show makes any profit, people get a split of that. And actually, as you move on, you you realize that's not sustainable and you can't do that all the time. And actors can't afford to do that. And particularly where we are after COVID, um we we you just it's it's that it becomes a really, really difficult model. And for mm. us, uh, where we are in our trajectory, we don't want to be doing that. So we've we've moved to a position where we can offer actors and creatives fees and, and and fairly solid fees. So it just puts a pressure, and the big Greek work really puts a pressure on the on the balance sheet. So we've been thinking about how you might be able to do that um, without having the actors necessarily on stage with you. So one of the things we've been thinking about, particularly with Antigone, is what if we have a, a version of uh, the chorus, maybe on screens or on monitors. Um, we came up with a, quite a silly idea uh, in one workshop that we we kind of did it a little bit like a, a Greek drama version of uh, Question Time, where we had uh, a Crayon and Antigone on stage with with a, a substitute Fiona Bruce. Uh, Fiona right. Bruce is what we were calling her. Um, <laughs> and on the Zoom screen, the live audience would be the chorus. But I suppose you have to sort of go back to each individual play and what's the role of the chorus in the pl in that play? Because they they differ quite wildly, don't they? Some of them are quite participatory mm. in the in the events. Some are active advice. Some feel like they influence the decisions that are being made, and others yes. they don't. They feel a little bit more um, decorative or or uh, illustrative of a theme rather than the, the narrative. So I guess it depends on what what they're there for. But yes, I think the big big thing I'm really excited about is scale and getting bodies on stage again but it's expensive <laughs> yes and, and i suppose particularly post uh, covid that is exactly what we all want to see is a big production of some sort that uh, and partly because we're fascinated to see how all that's going to work in the future um uh, but also because that's partly why we go to theater because we like to see these things that are presented to us and we have to think oh that's great how did they do that yeah and i i think there's also something something really really brilliant about uh again depending on the play but really brilliant about a greek chorus that they become us really in some ways don't they 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 they're an on-stage audience and particularly when um you break down the text of the chorus and give each individual member a bit of the text so we've never really done it well, we've yeah maybe a little bit but we've never really done it where the whole chorus speak in unison we've tended to break mm -hmm. it down not necessarily to make individual characters but just have slightly different voices particularly when the chorus disagree with each other that's that's really interesting because it shows us on on stage that the the people in the play are debating what's the right thing to do as are we as audience members which again i think i keep using that word democratic but it puts us and our uh, the predicament back on us so we're debating whether Medea should kill the kids or not, or we're debating whether the, the next course of action uh, is the right one to do. And it's not, I, th I think I'm, I'm probably being quite simplistic on the, um, whether it's right or wrong, but there's lots of nuances within that, of course, that we're, we're, we're being asked to kind of consider what, what this person should do, which makes us think, makes us participate. Pay. but i so i think there's that yeah. bit that we're missing and that we want to go well i certainly want to go back to the theater and i want to engage in something and that's a little bit trickier i think when it's a two-hander when it's when there's a company of people on stage you see the world of the play and so you kind of get a bit more of a, um, a theatrical exciting but you also get a deeper view of the society around it's all about context mm. um how does crayon make his decisions in this play well, it's, a re it, it's affected by the people around him, the circumstances he's within. So when you don't have a chorus represented in whatever way, I sort of think you kind of miss the context in which the decision's being made. And it's just really exciting to see a large amount of people on stage. It's just thrilling. 
And it's unlike watching TV when there's lots of people in a crowd scene or a film where there's a, a, a riot scene or something. It's very unlike that. I think there's something when you go into the theatre and you're part of a big event or a big, it, it just feels substantial. It's really tantalising, mm. I think. Yeah, and that probably does go right back to the way they were presented originally in, in a religious setting as well. So that probably heightened up the the effect even more but having the whole of the or you know nearly the whole of the town sitting there watching the play with a lot of their fellow townspeople on stage performing that must have been quite something um for for them as a communal experience yeah yeah and i think so there's a i suppose in that sense there's a a connection to the idea of the i uh, of storytelling and and playing I know that person isn't really that person, but I get the device. The play allows us to explore these incredibly ugly, difficult, uh, terrible, potentially uh, awful things in our society and what humans are capable of, but with the safety of it being a play. Mm. So these things don't really happen, which which I think then you potentially can suspend your disbelief even further and, and ponder the horrors because it's okay, it's a play. But the fact your brain has gone through pondering these dilemmas um, is the point, I suppose. So, yes, I suppose seeing people, mm. seeing members of your community as well. And I think that's interesting. Well, chorus is when I've seen productions where the chorus has been quite representative of the audience. That's fascinating because if your chorus doesn't, there will be people in the theatre going thinking, well, they, they don't really represent us as a society. Mm. So that's really pertinent at the moment. And one thing we talked about, just referring back to that Antigone where they're all on a question time Zoom call, uh, one thing we were talking about was get, uh, taking data from the census or some local authority data of how it actually is our society. And it might be that area. So if we're performing in Greenwich, what's the Greenwich demographic? Uh, of ages, right. of gender, or of ethnicity, uh, um, uh, disabilities. And so you then divide that by 13 and you come up with your representative chorus, if you like. So it really takes on this civic duty, which I think it may, you know, I'm not going to pass a judgment whether it's right or wrong, but I feel sometimes theatre's lost a bit of that. Uh, and I'm really, really excited about getting putting again, putting that predicament back in the room, sharing these ideas so the the audience debate it. One of the things I, I, I think when our work is most successful is when you go to the bar in the interval or afterwards and people are deb or, or indeed when they're leaving the venue, they're debating the things that have happened in the play. The worst thing is when you hear someone say something along the lines of, you know, oh, wasn't it wonderful they learnt all their lines or how do they remember <laughs> all of those words? And and luckily I haven't heard that with any of our work because I wouldn't be very happy about it. <laughs> but but actually um, it's thrilling. Um, there was our last production was was a production of a Beth in March 2020 and between the matinee and the evening myself and the actor who played Macbeth uh said oh should we pop out and get some air and just you know have a bit of a chat and because sometimes when you're in the theater it, it becomes quite intense you think let's go and have a break mm. and and so we walked mm. out and as we left the theater some of the school groups were still and and some people are a bit poo pooey about school groups oh well you just sell it to school groups and you go wow this is actually for me that feels even more special because this could be for some of them their first experience of theater uh, this right. could be a make or break. This could put them off for life or or completely entrance them. So I sort of feel that that um, obligation and responsibility pretty, pretty big. But anyway, so when we were walking down outside uh, from the theatre and we walked past, I think it was Greg's or something, and, and out burst a couple of young people who went, God, it's Macbeth, it's Macbeth. <laughs> and we sort of, and he said hello and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And it was all very weird and very awkward. And we're walking along and we were quite dismissive of, dismissive of it. And then I turned to the actor, Jamie O'Neill, who played Macbeth. And I said, actually, that's quite cool in a way. You're a bit of a rock star. Because, of course, they didn't recognize me because I'm the director. So they wouldn't have a clue who I was. But, but it was it's a bit rock star. And went, yeah, that was kind of cool. And then it was a few moments on that you realize you've made an impact. So not just the impact inside mm -hmm. the auditorium. But the impact is now with these young people who are going to go back. And you could hear them in Greg's talking about, well, he shouldn't have killed the doctor. He shouldn't have done that to the doctor. And he left his wife. And how did he leave? No wonder she went mad. He didn't talk to her. And I thought this group of young people have entirely got this. They're talking about the debate. Mm. And really exciting when Beth, they weren't talking about the witches. Because I think so often in productions, the witches usurp the actual debate. Right. The play. Yeah. 
because it's fun and it's theatrical yeah. and it's you know whereas i was really intrigued by by listening there's a little spot at the greenwich theater that front of house where i can hide i know this sounds a bit creepy but there's a, there's a, a staircase <laughs> that the public don't uh, have access to and you can stand and you can hear in the in in the foyer in the in the bar area you can overhear what and because this is very dangerous because they might say things you don't want to hear but mm. but it's quite useful because you you pick up on on things some very basic things like sight lines or the music's too loud or very often for one us there's too much smoke and those sorts of things <laughs> but you also hear the debates um about the play and then i go and feed that back to the actors they were really they were really with mcduff tonight Whereas yesterday, that audience was really with Macbeth at the end. Mm. Um, so it just means that it stops becoming a performance. The metaphorical curtain lowers, we clap and we go home and that's it. It just means we, that stays with us. And I think that's what the Greeks do brilliantly. They empower us as an audience and they force very Brechtian, actually. I mean, of course, you know, mm. a, a few years later, but Brecht sort of re-establishing. <laughs> Theatre has got the power to make you debate, understand, empathise, and then empower, charge you up. Go and change stuff. Um, if you're not happy with the world you live in, go and change it. And I think this is what the writers, you know, the, the great tragedians were doing, you know, putting us in impossible situations and asking the audience, how are you going to change this world? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that story you were telling about your Macbeth there, that that you can imagine that happening with someone walking out of having seen uh, an Oris Dyer or an Oedipus Rex uh, in exactly the same way, because mm. they're in because they're dealing with those basic big questions of life, then people can immediately, I think, take them into their own lives and uh, relate them to today. They are timeless in in that sense, but we have to make them accessible in some way. And they have to come I off the page, most importantly, because yes. they're plays at the end of the day. Yeah. And actually, I do find Greek dramas, I, I personally find them incredibly accessible. Maybe that's because I also work quite a lot with Elizabethan and Jacobean text, which sometimes mm. is completely impenetrable. And you sit for hours going, what does that word mean? Um, yeah. You know, and you've, you've got to have the glossary and the dictionaries out. And, you know, and sometimes in rehearsal, that feels a bit of a slog um, because of the language. But actually, I think when you have a, a relatively uh, w one translator I used to go to quite a lot was Philip Vallecott. Um, mm -hmm. who, would, who would produce his adapt adaptations, well, his translations, in, in quite academic form, but still quite exciting theatrically. Um, you might not necessarily use a translation directly for performance, but would still have a performative nature of it and make it very clear and the footnotes and the introduction was very good. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really great start and you understand what's going on. There's a clarity. In fact, we have a, the theatre company, we have a, a book club once a month and Antigone was, on, uh, was one of our, our books. Um, and every single actor uh, that was on the book club that week hadn't really done any Greek drama at all and all said, all remarked how easy and how clear and how simple the play was. Mm. And in its simplicity allowed you to debate the nuances and I thought that's really interesting. Is that what the tragedians are doing? They're saying, here's a relatively straightforward plot. Here's a relatively straightforward dilemma uh, in terms of how it's presented. But the dilemma is the thing that's nuanced and complicated. The, the, the issue, the problem, the circumstance, that's the thing. But we have to all understand what the problem is or the dilemma is for us to, in order for us to debate it, if that makes sense. So I think, so yeah. I think there is an accessibility. But yes, how then you perform them... Um, is a golden question <laughs> and well they didn't leave us any stage directions so you as a director you have completely free reign effectively don't you yes and and uh, the big debate that happened certainly about five ten years ago when we were doing the majority of our greeks was how to show violence because of course traditionally things would happen yeah. off stage which we certainly would have reviews so sort of local blogs and vlogs and such like um would would be dissatisfied that the violence didn't come on stage and you go, but that's the format. That's the, <laughs> that's the way it works. But, but the argument back often came to us. Yes, but this is now. So, you know, you cut Shakespeare and you change genders in Shakespeare. So why don't you change the format mm -hmm. of the Greek drama? And you sort of go, that's an interesting provocation. Okay. Um, so we did, we did get to play uh, productions. So our production of women of Troy in 2012 when when the women would come back, we did use an awful lot of blood, and and um, it, you would see that the violence has happened off stage, but you'd see the consequence of the violence, which was pretty harrowing, mm. actually.
I also I think there's something more, potentially more powerful in the violence happening off stage. So you don't have to do any COD stage combat type stuff, which we then all know is not real. Actually, if the if they come back on stage and it's revealed, uh, you see the impact and therefore your brain uh, and your imagination fills the gaps. And that's probably a bit more horrific than anything we could put on stage or or devastating or impactful. And I think the tragedians probably knew that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And um, that seems to be the the main reason everyone I've talked to is of a similar opinion to that, that really it's much more powerful. If we leave these to the imagination, the human mind can do so much more. And as you say, you know, uh, killing children on stage is never going to be realistic because you're going to have a rubber doll or something to <laughs> represent the children, hopefully, and nothing too realistic. Just to pick up on something, to go back to something you said earlier there, there's power in the chorus because we've got lots of people on stage and they're working together or against each other but there's also a lot of power in the events that are happening to the individual Oedipus Agamemnon you know these are people who have crushingly bad things happen to them so is it that combination of the personal and the social that makes them work the way they do yeah got both things going on there and they kind of got to talk to each other within the context of the play yeah and I, I think it's the way I have framed it in rehearsal before is it's the the domestic, the personal, the family versus the political and the societal. And so what so I suppose the perfect example of that in, in, with Antigone, it's his niece. And I if you're going to, uh, you know, if you're going to pardon your family, you know, if you're going to pardon anyone, it should be someone in your family. But he's already made his political decree now, very public. And so he's in the impossible choice. And, and maybe some people listening go, well, it's not the impossible choice. I would choose my family. Or others might think there's no, cho- no choice at all. He's said what he's going to do politically and he's going to stick to that. And that's the right thing to do. But I think that's the point, isn't it? The writers aren't necessarily telling us which the right, what's the right answer, what's the, the perfect outcome. They're saying, here's this incredibly impossible decision you debate the outcome. And, mm. and one thing I work with a lot with, with actors, um, because it's very tempting, I think, sometimes as actors and, and creatives, uh, direct, I know directors do this quite a lot as well, is we want to like the people we're playing or we like want to like the people that, you know, if you're directing the characters. And so you look for all this justification. Well, they're doing this because of this and they're doing that because of that. And sometimes I find that gets in the way because it's not our job to make them likable. It's our job to present the facts. So, of course, and I was talking to an actor relatively recently about playing Medea, and actually after about half an hour, she'd sort of talked herself out the job uh, because she said, um, you know, well, I could never, of course, could never kill my own children. And I said, well, I'm certainly not asking you to do that. Um, That's not a a requirement of an audition. (laughs) You know, How far would you go for this job? Not at all. But we've got to be... uh, well, we don't have to be, but for me, there's there's a bit more power and impact if the performer um, presents the facts. These are the the situ- This is mm. the situation I'm in. I'm not. I'm. I'm not making them likable or dislikable. I'm presenting how they are, which which then again shoves that back to the audience. That gives that back to them. So yes, I think it's it's seeing the individual in a form of extreme crisis. And of course, we're talking more about the tragedies here, aren't we, I suppose, but, but yeah. that's, really my, that's really my form. I, I haven't really done any of the comedies, mm-hmm. um, um, which, which because of its extremity, even if it is slightly domestic, even if it is family, you know, the Oresteia, it's a, it's a, a soap opera of a family predicament, right? But it has mm-hmm. incredible, incredible ramifications. It has a world impact. Everybody will be impacted by these decisions. So Mm. it isn't just a case of, and I I use this as a a terrible example, but I use it in rehearsal a lot. It's not that we've, you know, left the iron on or we forgot to put the milk bottles out. You know, we're on a different, entirely different level to this. Uh, One foul move and this whole thing could spin off. Uh, And then when you Mm. add the gods into the mix, I mean, goodness, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you sort of, there's nowhere for them. They're, they are, they're doomed, aren't they? And that's what I think makes Modea incredibly remarkable is she's rewarded. Um, I sort of think that's, yes. that's phenomenal, really. You sort of, she's rewarded for her choices, which must have caused a scandal. I'd love to have been there. That'd be fantastic. 
yeah, you can kind of imagine the gasp that must have gone round the auditorium when she got away with it, wouldn't you? It's, yeah. Um, oh, I hope so. Because I think that's another thing is modern audiences, we're too quiet, we're too passive. Um, we sort of sit back and I don't quite know where that's come from. A friend of mine has a theory, it's Victorian theatre, this sort of idea of sit down, be quiet and be proper. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, whereas in Elizabethan theatre, we'd be oohing and ahhing and joining on and, you know, sort of a, a, yeah. a lot more energetic. And I would love to experience what that that huge auditorium in, in ancient Greece of of the reactions to these things. Uh, yes audibly you know um there are there are contemporary accounts aren't there of some place being so shocking people would be sick and wasn't that, you know that's when, right yes yes there are so we i mean everybody i've read always says that you know these were obviously quite visceral performances that were uh, and the audiences were boisterous um uh, difficult to go further than that i guess because we don't know bit bit better probably with elizabethan theater we can maybe imagine that being crammed into the globe mm. especially these days when we can go and stand there ourselves and kind of get a sense of it but yeah a bit and quite a lot more than just booing and hissing i suspect was was going yeah, on and, and so that you know it's a conversation because i think that's the that's sometimes we struggle in a contemporary rehearsal room with this fourth wall nonsense Mm. And what we have to remind ourselves quite often, I think this is because because actors now are trained not just in theatre, but in, in television and film. Um, and and you very often I do find myself certainly in auditions and early weeks of rehearsal is reminding everyone there's no such thing as a fourth wall. Um, mm. They are communicating with us. So when a, when a when a character puts the idea into the room, they are genuinely putting it into the room, not as a hypothetical sort of. Um, I'm thinking to myself, I'm sharing this 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 issue or this thing I've got to overcome, yeah. um, which gives us that 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 civic responsibility. I think that all sounds very heavy and a bit sort of oh gosh this sounds very boring but actually it could be exhilarating in a theater in a in, a, in a, an auditorium where you're actively involved in a story and by actively i don't need to get you up and ask you what your birthday is and all that sort of thing it's not it doesn't have to be a panto trick but actually being in in this arena in this debating forum where we are asked to participate in the in the the action to a certain degree um makes for a riveting theatrical experience far far more interesting than sitting at the back of the olivier in the dark yeah and and bringing theatre indoors must be a big part of this and and having that divide between audience and stage that comes around um well post elizabethan certain, certainly um that must be a big part of how it's changed so that yeah we do get annoyed when someone makes too much noise next to us um and yeah. that kind of thing and and that's really that's very interesting in the space divide. Then that's the, what the proscenium arch is doing, isn't it? You know, it's dividing the playing space to the the the, the voyeurs. Um, and I haven't really done a great deal of work in the proscenium arch. In fact, at the Greenwich, we removed the proscenium arch uh, from Macbeth. Let's get rid of it. Let's not have any boundary at all uh, mm. between us and the audience. We are in a shared space. And I, I wonder, it'll be very interesting to see what happens post-COVID, where a lot of people now have been introduced to things like netflix where they might not have watched that sort of thing before whereas we haven't had much entertainment in the way of our normal entertainment whether people have got onto that sort of streaming platforms um how theater sort of responds because we can't really compete with the graphics and the the cgi and the all of that sort of stuff but what we can what we do have over uh, tv and film is the shared experience Mm -hmm. And it sounds maybe a little bit nostalgic and a bit sort of naff, but I mean, that's what the Greeks uh, and the Elizabethans were doing, right? I mean, that's the, when you look at the big periods of art and uh, certainly theatrical art, it's being in a space that is shared and in both cases shared light. Um, yes. Being done under the same lighting conditions. You are in this space with us. Whereas I suppose we've got conditioned over the last couple of hundred years, I suppose, where the lights go down in one part of the room and that means the other part of the room is now illuminated. And that convention, like, I, mm. it was interesting. Um, I worked with um, a drama school, a part time drama school, and some of the students there have never been to the theatre. And of course, because of COVID, I can't show them where to go to the theater or i can't take them to the theater so mm. but one student asked me last week what does this curtain thing mean at the end of a play 
when you know not not necessarily in Shakespeare, which I'm working with them, but they were doing another play, and it's this curtain at the end. Why is there a, what what's this curtain thing? And so I I I was sort of taken aback actually, and, and I had to then yeah. think, what is this device? A curtain lifts, and all of a sudden this world comes alive. It drops, and it no longer exists. It was just a fascinating idea because everything I do with Shakespeare mm-hmm. and Greek drama doesn't go anywhere near that device, because of course it's shared experiences it shared yeah. conditions um so certainly for us i mean i don't know whether everyone else will be doing it but certainly for us is, is harnessing that how can we work in mm. in studios or in or indeed at the greenwich theater how can we embrace this idea we're all in the same room we are all experiencing this thing together yeah. um and even in a greek tragedy there are laughs they're funny. Sometimes they're incredibly, incredibly funny and they inappropriately so. But I love that because you have someone in the audience chuckle and everyone sort of looks at the, why are you laughing at this? And then we laugh at the fact that someone's laughed. And, and if the actor can respond to that, I mean, I don't mean ad libbing, but if they can respond generously to listening to this auditorium, it's fascinating. It makes it alive. And I think that that's the thing that I don't know about you, Phil, but I'm desperate for that live in person, in the room, I can, I mean, this is going to sound a bit gross, but I can smell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that a, a review of Macbeth picked up about, um, you could smell the stage blood before you could see it. And that's brilliant. You yeah. can smell yeah. the blood. Wow. That's yeah. creepy, but that's really exciting. And yeah, you're, yes, you're right. That is absolutely what we've all been missing the last year. And how is it going to be getting back, do you think? I mean, you've, you've spoken about some of it there, but how soon do you think you'll have a production up and running? It's, I think it's really difficult to say. So the, the sort of situation is, is that theatre currently doesn't have any insurance for COVID. Mm. So if a theatre production happens and then they're shut down again, that's, that's it. There's no sort of um, support for them. So you, we're, we're seeing lots of announcements of shows, certainly West End shows, now looking more towards the autumn. Um, I, there was a couple of announcements last week and you thought, oh, I thought you'd already announced for June, but you're announcing for September. Uh, so it's a very softly, softly movie back, movie back thing, mm-hmm. um, which which I see why they're doing that. For us, um, it's difficult because we can't perform with a large company with social distancing. We need the full capacity or the potential of the full capacity. Mm. Um, we're also because of the residency and this is this, uh, we might not be very unique in this, but, but because we're in, in this residency, the theater has other projects that have offen- essentially they've got a year's worth of work to reprogram. So that puts a squeeze on how many weeks we can have to, to create something. So, so, there's a very, very slight possibility. We might be doing something in the summer, but it's a very, very, very small possibility. Uh, it's more likely for us to be early next year now. So we're, we're looking at February for a first show, which is will be two years. It's a small company like us with very, very limited means. I know everyone in theatre says that they don't have any money, but we literally, <laughs> we literally don't. And because we had a second show, we had a production of Head of Garbler about to open when COVID struck. And because of let's say faffing around with whether insurance would cover it. And in the end, because of the way theatres were closed, we weren't covered. We took an incredible loss because we wanted to make sure we could still pay the people who were engaged on that second show so that they weren't out of pocket. So we we came to an arrangement about their fees and and just to make sure that we could do what we could do, but that's left a big hole. So so again, we've we've been working to fill that up and, and get going. So that's not me getting the violins out. That's just the sort of pragmatic bit about yeah, you know, how, how it do is. you kick start? Yeah. How do you get this back? Yes. I mean, it's going to take um, the star name to open shows that aren't commercially obvious, I suppose, in the future for some years to yeah. come, probably. Yeah, and and that's star names has never really been our thing. The play's always been the thing. So we're hopeful that when we can get back, that people will go, that well, the play is still the thing. And we've then just got to demonstrate with our venue partners about it is clean, it is safe, we're looking after you. But actually, when you come to the venue, we don't want you to be worried about things like that. We want you to be comfortable. And by comfortable, I mean, let's let's be uncomfortable with some of the subject matter of the play. Let's be, you know, um, interrogated a bit but um, and engaged. But you're not worrying about social distance or you're not worried about if that handle's been cleaned and those sorts of things so so i think it's going to take some time but um i think there's probably going to be some pent-up 
want as well people going yes let's get back to that thing i think it'll just be about confidence so so we're, we're hoping by the new year and, and and presenting a season of work that people go ah i haven't seen that for a while and actually no uh, there's going to be loads of plays where you can honestly say i haven't seen that for a while because you won't, <laughs> because you <laughs> won't have seen no it for two years <laughs> so so in that respect it might be um a good one and we're really determined to keep performing productions of plays that aren't performed very often so greek drama should totally be part of our repertoire but we just have to find a way of making that uh, financially sustainable um and, and so we're looking at very different lots of different models at the moment uh, about how we mm. how we can do that but uh, anybody listening who wants to support that oh my gosh we'd love to talk to them uh, about it of course um because it's because i think that uh, very much like the the setup of ancient greek theater uh, 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 patronage you know the the idea mm. of uh, the society or or rich people in society would pay for it as a, as an honor as a something giving back to society um we th- we like to think that sort of thing is relatively new and and some people think it's a corporate 90s thing but it's not people have supported the arts from the start um so we just need some of those please <laughs> yes and and for their own reasons as well always <laughs> and it can be for their own but you know i suppose in a way if this is a greek drama predicament because um they may be doing it for their own reasons but if it supports something else for other people maybe there's a payoff and a buy off um that might be another podcast episode though sponsorship and uh, <laughs> corporate <laughs> responsibility i think is what we used to call it so tricky times coming up for for sure um for all of us and and i i think just speaking personally i mean i would agree there's there's sort of some concern about will it be safe to go back again although you know it's for the uk anyway our vaccination program seems to be busting the numbers that it needs to at the moment to get this possible again. But I think that experience of being in that crowd for the first time, maybe the second and third time as well, will feel, will feel odd because we haven't done it for a year at least. Now, I have to make a pitch here then because you want to do plays that aren't produced very often. So have you ever done and would you ever consider doing any Roman drama? We haven't, um, actually. We chatted a bit very long ago now uh, about Seneca and then I think we jumped actually we quite a jump to uh, Racine and um, Phaedra so I, so we, I think that was when we were looking around presenting Phaedra and which version where to go uh, with, with Phaedra and where, to, where which version we want to go with and then it didn't happen but um, what should we do well, I, my my vote would have gone with Phaedra because I think that's probably the most stageable of Seneca's work. I mean, Medea is really difficult, particularly because of the ending of throwing the children off the balcony and that whole thing about how do you make <laughs> that look realistic and how do you make the audience actually want to see that. Phaedra is probably a little bit more, not realistic, but slightly more believable in, in some of the, the words and the poetry in it. And the comedies are really difficult, I think. Talked about them on the podcast previously. They, they are pretty difficult to find comedy in without really doing a big rewrite on, on most yes, of Yes, and the comedies, I think, actually are tricky even. I, I, I certainly find even Shakespeare and early modern comedies, uh, again, it just may be way, the way that my brain works, but I find them far more difficult because I think the comedy very often is more politically appropriate of the time. It's a little mm. bit more specific. And if we're not quite getting the, the, the specific point, it's sort of lost on us, I guess. Whereas there's something a little bit more universally, universal about tragedy um, uh, and emotion in that respect, I suppose. That's, that's a, you know, that might be a bit crude to say that generally, but, but that's, that's, I, I do find the comedies a bit, and I, I've seen lots of Shakespeare where the productions have altered the text for the comedy sections, and they've contemporised them um, to varying effect. But that would be really interesting to see how that might work with with Roman. Um, I haven't, but Phaedra would be great. Yes, I can't remember. I'm trying to wrap my brains of why we didn't do it in the end. What I can't remember what happened. We we did a workshop. We did we workshop the Racine version, not not Seneca, but um we yeah it's a great story and that's the other thing they are great stories absolutely brilliant stories and actually i think of all the seneca it's probably the most greek like because you've got this constant flow of people coming on and off and describing what's happened 
off stage and there's a whole thing about the outside and the forest and the the hunting uh, and then the the internal of the palace where all the bad stuff happens i think there's lots to pick out in that one that's probably a little bit easier for people to well for an audience to appreciate and and get their heads around what we should do is we should put that into our lazarus book club for our associates to to read so a useful way of you to sound out what's interesting yeah, to people yeah it's been fantastic and it wasn't designed for this it the way what the reason we set it up was because we appreciated that actors were um, not working for a long time. So we went to our associates. There's about mm. 14, 15 people in our associate teams, a mixture of actors and also creatives, um, and, and said, how can we help you? What do you need? Uh, this was during the first lockdown. And so many people came back and said, we don't know what we need. We don't know how you can help. It, it just felt a sense of loss and, uh, uh, you know, not not sure knowing what to do. <laughs> Um, so uh, over time, though, we we, we talked to them about, well, would this help and would this help? And so out of lots of those conversations, it came a number of different projects, but one of them being the book club. Once a month, we give you send you the PDF or, a, a, you know, a, a link to an edition of the play and we read and then we meet. In fact, tonight's our, our next one and we meet and we chat for two hours. We don't read the play in the, in the club. We talk about it and we dissect it. And mm. absolutely, it's been fantastic particularly when our associates come from a range of experiences. So for some people, um, you, uh, last week's, last month rather, was Dr. Fausters. And one person very familiar with Christopher Marlowe uh, would reel off all the Marlowe facts and figures. And like, that's brilliant. And other people had no idea who uh, Fausters or, or Marlowe were. And so they would... Um, be kind of new to that but getting the different perspectives was fantastic so so it wasn't meant to be some sort of r&d lab for us to kind of explore plays but it totally has done it's which is fantastic um it raises issues that you didn't even consider because of your own perspective um and it puts other things at rest that you're concerned about which is which is fantastic mm. um so it's, just, it's a very early sort of um sounding board so i think that should go on the list and also, in the case of Dr. Fausters, because we are working on a production of it, reminded me of how far along the journey we've gone with the production. So there was something that, that someone remarked on the kind of medieval feel of it. And I actually, I don't see it as a medieval play at all. You've, my head has completely moved on. It feels very contemporary. And it was a really great reminder of, aha, that's how some people will view this play remember that because when they come to the theatre there'll be a level of expectation so how do we manage that or how do we invite that so it's all good so even when someone's saying exactly the opposite to what you think it is it's fantastic because you go yeah there will be other people who think that uh, and maybe they're right maybe their idea is better actually uh, so that's so that's it, 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 it's a fantastic opportunity to sound those ideas and listen to other people's responses and reactions to it um there hasn't been one yet where everyone said oh no oh no don't do that please don't do that um we found something in everything but but uh yeah it's a it, as i say a fantastic sort of instigator uh, and and provokes you to think well could this be and it never it, as i say it was never set up for me to give them a list of all the plays we're thinking of doing but actually everything on the reading list so far are plays that we think we're doing <laughs> or would like to do but Phage is a great, great, great play. Yeah, okay, you've got me on that now. That's good. Ah, oh, well, my work here is done. Excellent. I was going to say that was good, wasn't it? That was very productive, yeah. <laughs> great. So where, if anyone wants to connect with you, Ricky, what's the best way for them to stay in touch and to find out about Lazarus Theatre itself? Well, we're on social media, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and that's just Lazarus Theatre Company. You can put that into the, the search engine and, and up will come. Or our website is www.lazarustheatre.com. Dot com and it's all there we've got the main list you can sign up to to keep uh, up, up to date with everything uh, the websites are a little bit clunky at the moment because we're going through a rebuild oh we're having a very very whizzy new website it's very exciting i didn't think i'd get excited about things like this phil but i really do <laughs> Excellent. And particularly if there is um, a wealthy philanthropist who's interested, they should definitely get in touch with you. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and even, and, and we've got some wonderful supporters who are not particularly wealthy, but for them, you know, we, there's been some fantastic people where, where they've just come up and said, here's, here's two, 300 pounds. Does that help? And actually you go, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It does. If, if it, it's, 
uh, and that's where you realize where you are working and com uh, collaborating with your community because some people think theater you know oh well i don't have a million pounds to give you but actually if everyone sort of went well here do you know what well, I, I want to be part of this thing here's a hundred pounds does that get you any fun mm. and actually when you work it out you go hundred pounds that's a couple of costumes so that really does make a difference. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely. And, and conversing with other artists, other people that are listening who, who want to create uh, productions of Greek drama as well. You know, we, we, it's always about trying to expand our networks and see who's out there. And, and we've got to band together because uh, we're part of a Christopher Marlowe uh, network of trying to keep Christopher Marlowe's plays in, in performance because plays need performance mm -hmm. history to stay alive um right. sure they're published they they're on a shelf but actually because they're theater pieces like greek drama we need to put them in the repertoire um and we want them to be in our repertoire and we might need to start with the big titles like medea and antigone that might for some greek drama fans might think, oh not another production of those but um but for so many theater goers and people who don't go to the theater they'll never have seen a production of it so we sort of need to start mm. with the big accessible titles that, that people might know so that in order that a few years down the line, we can be doing the obscures, uh, the ones that hardly ever have any performance history because we'll have built that community around it. So, so love, love to absolutely hear about anybody with a passion for it and, and we can see how we can work together on it. Wonderful. On that very optimistic note, we will take our leave of you there, Ricky. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Plays need performance. What a great reminder to us all that as much as we might enjoy reading and discussing plays, it should always come back to seeing them being performed. And for all of us, actors, directors, creatives, theatre staff, audience, being involved in a collective experience. My thanks again to Ricky for his time and speaking so freely about the joys and challenges of producing theatre. If you had any doubts about the meaning and purpose of producing Greek and other ancient drama in the modern world, then I'm willing to bet that listening to Ricky speak about the plays with such passion and enthusiasm will have dispelled any such thoughts. I've put the links to Lazarus Theatre in the show notes. Please do go and have a look at their website, where you can join their mailing list and, if you feel inclined, make a donation to help them with their work. Next time will be the restart of the historical narrative, with the Greeks and the Romans in the rearview mirror, but definitely not forgotten. There will, I'm sure, be many occasions in coming episodes when I will be referring back to them both. I look forward to your company then, but in the meantime, please take a look at the new website for the podcast, www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com, and don't forget to join the new Facebook group. If you have liked the old Facebook page in the past, then please take a moment to join the group. Unfortunately, Facebook rules don't allow me to simply move you from the page to the group. Details are in the show notes. As ever, if you have any comments or concerns, you can reach me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Mm -hmm.